Good afternoon. Today is September the 1st, 2011, and we are located at the Public Library of Cincinnati and Hamilton County. We're delighted to have as our interviewee today, Mr. William Thomas Aris, accompanied by his wife, Bonnie, and I am Jim Griever and will be conducting the interview, and Brian Powers will be handling the audio and video equipment. Tom, before we get started on your uh, Navy and military and Army career, why don't you give us a little background of what your family life was like growing up in uh, Akron, Ohio, wasn't it? Yes, sir. I, uh, my recollection of the, of the Second World War is my father uh, was a Canadian, and we lived in Akron, Ohio, and uh, my father was a civil defense air warden, and our house was probably about a half a mile away from uh, Firestone a tire company and again so we were probably potentially a bombing site destroying site and I can remember my dad was so proud of, of being an air warden and at that time I believe he was about 36 or 37 years old and had uh, three sons and uh, again just going through it how my father was and how he the responsibility and accepting of that and then uh, we moved out of the city into a small farm and I guess I was about nine years old when we moved there. And as I recall, uh, we were in just south of the Akron Airport, which had at that time uh, a manufacturing Goodyear aircraft manufactured F4U Corsair airplanes. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of that air traffic coming around the house. And uh, I can remember standing out in the yard in our house I say the position of it, the planes would be coming around the house and they'd be on their final and they'd just be laying on their side and it was almost like you could reach out and touch the pilot. And every now and then a uh, pilot would give us one of those waves and again to a kid that's nine or ten years old how neat it was. And then uh, we moved from there on out to a bigger farm south of Akron and we were at that time then in the approach to the Akron Canton Airport. But again, at that time, it was just so neat of seeing those things and being kind of involved. And I can remember going back uh, with my parents. Uh, when I was born in 1936. And I can remember vaguely uh, when President uh, Roosevelt talked about uh, Pearl Harbor and what was going to do in the inf famous day of history, those kinds of things. But again, as a child, you don't, I can just vaguely remember it. And then at the end of the Second World War, again, I were at the farm, and I can remember the, uh, when the announcement came out that World War II, the surrender had been made both in Europe and then later on in August about the VJ Day in, in Japan, and the war was over. And this, as I recall, the, the traffic, we lived on a county road, which was pretty well traveled, but this hearing the horns, everybody was just tooting their horns as loud as could be up and down the road. And, Again, you know, my mother and my father, my younger brother, my, my older brother, again, just, you know, appreciating what was going on. And I had, uh, I say my father was, you know, had three sons and was 36, I believe. And, but my mother had two brothers that were in, in the Navy and in the war. And uh, my, my older uncle was on Guadalcanal. And, you know, stories that, you know, he would come back on leave and tell us. And he was a CB, and probably the biggest story I can remember from my my uncle Bill was that he came back one time and he, as I said earlier, as I recall, that he was a CB and working on Guadalcanal, mm -hmm. order thing, and came back and he had a piece of a Japanese airplane that had crashed in, and he was able to salvage a piece of that airplane. And what it was was a fuel line with a gate valve on it. But again, it's just like you know those kinds of things. But that's the best I can recall the Second World War, you know, my personal involvement you know, with our family, but again, just enthusiasm at the end of the war. And it's like, again, be able to uh, remember that, be able to have some remembrance of how important it really was, not only to our family, but again, to the country. Well, since Uncle Bill was in the Navy as a CB, he could have been your inspiration to join the Navy later on. There was impact, right, because I, I guess probably my older brother had, you know, same thing, but with my two uncles being in the Navy and uh, Akron ended up as a Naval Air Station, NAS Akron, 
and my older brother, uh, he joined uh, the reserves, and that's what it was at the end of the Second World War. He just hit it at the right time and joined the reserves. And NES Akron had a blimp squadron there, along with uh, some several other squadrons of ships, of uh, airplanes. So again, that kind of got it going, building some enthusiasm in, in me, and he was five years older than I am. So again, as I approached getting out of high school, uh, Korean War was, I graduated in 54, Korea was going, and uh, you know, something, I needed to do something. I had a job, and I thought, you know, give the military a crack and it was like what's the best one to go to go to the Navy because of some history in the family. So I joined uh, the Naval Air Reserve in Akron and I ended up in a in a squadron it was called BS 651, Victor Sugar 651 and uh, it was kind of neat and you know what I started out as uh, joining in uh, I believe it was in October November of 54 right after high school and uh, I joined a squadron, and we, it was an anti-submarine warfare squ uh, squadron. And we had two ships and uh, two planes, when I say ships, two planes. And one was an AF-2S and the other one was an AF-2W. And one was a hunter plane, hunting out submarines, and the other one was uh, carried with sauna boys and uh, hmm. other equipment to take that sub out of commission. And uh, I was fortunate and I guess maybe aggressive enough to, uh, I wanted to be flying. And now, what was a sauna boy? Sauna boy was a, uh, a device that was dropped into the ocean and it would pick up sounds of the subs and then transmit it back to the plane. And they, we had a radar on there and the sauna boys and some other equipment I can't recall at the present time, but the sauna boy was a big thing in a radar antenna to locate the sub if it was on the surface. I say we would locate it and then come back later and or at the same time because your companionship was the destroyer basically of the sub to drop the uh, drop a torpedo or whatever it might be to take that after you out after your recruiting uh, initiation were you sent to basic training anywhere I went to basic training at, at NAS Glenview Illinois and uh, spent three months there I was there from April through June of of 55, I believe, yes, I'm 55, and uh, taking that 90-day accelerated course, you came out as an E3, which was kind of mm -hmm. nice in a way. Uh, not that it meant anything, but again, it was you weren't a recruiter anymore. You were you were an airman coming out and came out, and I ended up, I went, I, my striker was an, as an AT, which was an aviation electronics technician with a radar, so it was ATR slash AN. Okay. And, uh, the next venture would have been to go back for another three-month course the following year uh, back to Glenview to get to make third class. You get out of that 90 day, you make third class. And things just kind of developed on out. But I say when we came back uh, after that, went back to Akron and did my annual weekend or my weekend training once a month, and then we had the annual training. And the first time. Uh, we went, as I recall, we went to uh, Key West, Florida, NAS Key West. Oh, great. And down there, uh, I said I was pretty much, I, I was getting uh, half skins, uh, yeah, flight skins, what it was called. And I guess my aggressiveness and wanting to do what I needed to do, I, they, they, my bosses took care of us, and uh, I got half skin. So when he's flying, he got half pain. And I can remember we were out with, with the team, the two, a, you know, the two AFs, and uh, you know I'm a radar operator, and uh, trying to find a sub that's out there, you know, playing with us. And uh, you know, found a, I thought I'd found the, the sub, and pilot, you know, you know, he would you vector him in and do all that stuff, get him onto into the uh, where the the sub is at. And again, as we fly along, next thing there's. He says, open a hatch and take a peek. I'll flip the, the window open or the drag down, flip it open, here's a sub on the surface, and the guy's on the sub. Really? <laughs> so, you, get, you know, that enthusiasm that builds that, you know, you've you done found it. Yeah, we found it. Not we, I, but it was we found some. And, uh, you know, it's another thing that really makes you feel good about what you're doing and learning. And, uh, like I say, the 
you know, it was just such a great experience. And pilots we had were, were uh, Second World War pilots and Korean War pilots coming back. And just, you know, young guys. I mean, just everybody's so enthusiastic. And the CEO of the unit, his name was, he was a lieutenant commander, uh, TMB Butterwood Jr. And he was from Atlanta, Georgia. And he was a big Alabama. I mean, he was probably about six foot twelve and about that. Oh, he even got the ship in, into the plane because he was a monster. But just, just everybody, all the pilots, everybody got along good. I mean, it just we had a great unit. Good teamwork. Oh, yeah, that's what it is. It was all teamwork. But again, it was just, you know, for a kid, you know, it was fun being around and doing what you knew and had to get done. And, you know, everybody, nobody took advantage of anybody. Everybody worked together. And, you know, it was just great. It was a great well, experience. While you were at the uh, Naval Air Station, Key West, which is now called Boca Chica and may not have been that name then, but is now, uh, did you have any time for R&R &R to go into Key West and get to know the area, or was it all work? It, it was pretty much work. And what, you know, unfortunately, as a kid, I didn't really appreciate it, but they, they took uh, anybody wanted to go down to uh, Havana, they took them. And like a dummy, I'm, you know, I'm 19, I don't have enough brains to, you know, but Havana, a bunch of Cuba. Came back and said, Ooh, oh, they right. flew down to Cuba, which is only 90 miles right. away. Right, they flew down. They took, you know, I think it was an R4 and R5 plane, multi engine, and it took anybody who wanted to go for the weekend. You know, after it went, it was like, you dummy, you should have jumped on too. But, they, you know, guys came back and said, how great it was. But this is before Castro came into power too. Sure. But it was, you know, again, you know, like I say, the, the bosses took care of the grunts. They, you know, but again, it's teamwork. You know, everybody needs each other to get the job done professionally in the right way. I think, and after I got done with, with Key West, we came back and uh, we traded, uh, phased out the S2Fs, and our squadron was the first squadron. As I understand, we got S2F trackers, which was a twin engine, high wing ship. And uh, after we came back, that plane came in. Well, I got an opportunity to go to NAS Norfolk for, I believe it was a two-week stretch to learn how to be a new type of radar. I think it was called APS-21. And I went down. APS-21? APS-21. What was APS for, do you recall? I don't. Okay. But it was a different kind of a radar. Okay. Well, we had an updated one. And I spent two, yeah, I spent two weeks down there at NAS uh, Norfolk learn how to operate that. And again, when we came back to, to Akron, you know, I, I think I was the only one at that time had the training on it. Hmm. And so it just fit into, I think that's when I got, got the half skins for flight. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, kind of neat experience you know, as a result of that. Uh, I either flew most of the time, this was a, a pilot, co-pilot plane. And uh, they, I can't remember the exact or the pilot we were flying with, but they were looking for volunteers to go to St. Louis because the, the second, the right-hand seat pilot, his, somebody in his family was sick and he was going to need somebody to fly the plane. That was the S2F tracker? The S2F. Mm -hmm. So, again, it was, it was on a Saturday in the evening and then we were going to go fly to St. Louis and come back Sunday night. And, you know, we were flying at night and, uh, you know, got doing the radar stuff and, and the other fella in the, the left-hand seat from me, was the uh, took care of the uh, sauna boys that other equipment, and anyhow we're flying along. I remember Potty called back and said, "You know, you guys, you know, put on standby. You want to take a nap? You know, go ahead." So I'm laying back in the seat next, you know, about half awake, half asleep, and next thing I know, the plane is just vibrating big time. Oh, and it is like it's coming apart. And you know, as soon as it happened, Potty's on the ear and said, "You know, you know." Tighten up your seat belts. Don't know what's happened here, but you know, be prepared. You might have to go. And you know, how did you interpret that? Did you have a parachute? Yeah, you did. Yeah, it was there. But where I'm at, the seat I'm in, I, I'm the first one out, so I got to get out of my seat and get to the galley way here, flip the seat up, and get to the hatch. And you know, like, mm. yeah, you know, I know what I got to do. Don't want to do it, but you know, if you want to live, you got to do what you got to do. Well, yeah, they. Uh, they flew and uh, we got it done and uh, we got it into Glenville, Illinois. Uh -huh. And what it was, what somebody forgot to put the pin in the trim tab, the bolt, 
and somehow the pin came out, the bolt came out, and that that trim tab was flopping in the wind, and that was what was causing us the ship to be going nuts. So anyway, we got on the ground. That could have been an airborne disaster. Oh yes, yes. But again, this you know, good pilots, new plane. But again, it was it was it went like it should have went. Yeah. Had you ever parachuted out of a plane before that event or after that we event? We didn't have to parachute out, but that was my responsibility. I was the first one who had to go out because I had to flip my seat up to get to the, get to the hatch so that my crew member on the next side of me he could get out, and a co pilot, co pilot, they could go out to the top of it. Now that's if you ditched. Right. You did not have a parachute. Oh yeah, I had a parachute. So was he saying you might have to go out with a parachute? Right. Right. He's talking about you might have to go out the door. And that would have been an exciting event. <laughs> Middle of the night raining. I mean, it was. Middle, Middle of the night too. Oh, yeah. oh my. But again, it was somewhere over Lake Michigan. No, we were we we're still on the ground. We're going, we're going, we're going cut across okay. country. Okay. From Akron, you know, there's no water up there unless you go up to the lakes. But yeah. here, we had to divert to NAS Glenview. Okay. So I had kind of, it was kind of, things worked out. It, it worked out. It was great. It was great. Did that enhance your interest in flying from then on? Or? I didn't change it a bit. I mean, it was, it was like, you know, it was just part Routine. of the job. It's part of the job. Yeah. There's a lot of happy times. Not every now and then there's a, a love time, but it was, you know, I was a kid. You know, I was 19, 20. I was 19. How would you describe the uh, technical? Uh, ability of the equipment, like the sauna boys, was it technically advanced? Was it reliable, dependable? St stuff didn't work, or I, everything dependable? We, we used worked. I mean, yeah. every you know, we had again with the S two F tractor. You know, that was an old plane. Yeah. And it was a huge plane in a way. I think it had the largest reciprocating engine in the fleet, and the pilot was up in front of us between the pilot and the crew. And there was only one crew. It was a huge fuel tank. So you went in a hatch on the back. They had a, at the back of the plane. He climbed up on a wing and jumped in the cockpit. So again, there was no personal conversation or seeing each other while you're flying, other than a fuel tank in between. You can't, you know, you can't see anybody. But anyway, I said ships were good, but they were. My understanding, you know, even then and now, that it was a very stable ship. And it can take a lot of batter and but again it was a navy plane it was designed to right take a lot of punishment yeah. but again it was it was fun it was fun great got, got done there i'm trying to think we uh, we transferred uh they they closed down nas akron and moved us to port columbus and when we went to uh, columbus uh the, they changed planes again they went to uh, p2v neptunes which was a huge plane multi-engine, I, as I recall, I believe it had a Genesis takeoff on it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I didn't get the, that was about the time I, I joined the highway patrol and you know, I didn't, you know, I was there for, for the meetings but didn't get the fly in in P2B. But again, just another, you know, three different planes in a very short time. I mean, each one improved over the other one, but the S2F, as I recall, it, it was just brought into the fleet also signed to the, to the reserve fleet, so it was, you know, everything was new, and again, the P2P was, I think, was the latest technology to another upgrade. So at that point, you know, I say it was at Akron or at uh, Port Columbus, and then I was in transition, I got uh, joined the Highway Patrol, and uh, that was in 58, or 57, I'm sorry, 50, 57. And I started on a highway patrol, and then I was on a highway patrol for about a year and a half. Then I got got a nice letter from Uncle Sam and said, you know, greetings from the president. Uh, we would like to have you in the military. So I got end up. Well, now drafted. this is despite the fact that you'd already been in the Naval Reserve for several years, there was some disconnect there in terms of thinking you were still available. Is that right? Yes, sir. I. Uh, you know, I got the draft notice and, went and talked to the folks at the Navy, at the Naval Reserve, and I said, now, isn't that big a deal? When you go in, you tell them, you take your paperwork here and tell them, you know, you're in the reserves, and you'll end up with us. And with the Navy? With the Navy. Staying with the Navy, which you've been with and you liked. And I liked. <laughs> so anyhow, when I got, got into, uh, 
had to report to Akron, the draft board, and they sent us to Columbus, which was the reception center, I believe, and uh, went through the, the process there and gave them a paper says, you yeah, know, we'll look into it, but ended up, uh, you know, anybody wants to go here, you know, who wants to go here and there, and what military service you want, well, of course, I put down the Navy, and so the second would be the Marine Corps, and didn't know about anything else, wasn't concerned. I figured I'd go into the Navy. Well, came out and said, okay, everybody's you're over here in the Army. So, uh oh. <laughs> well, it sounds like they totally ignored the fact that you were in the Navy and still actively drilling as a reservist. Right. How did that happen? I, I can't, I, I also, I, to this day, I still don't know what happened, other than I ended up on a train and uh, we're going to. Louisville, Kentucky, I'm going to Fort Knox. <laughs> and not to a Navy base. Not to a Navy base. So when I get off the off the train to Louisville, and I'm I'm a, an Ohio kid from Northern Ohio, and I get off the, the train, I need to drink water. I'm thirsty, so I walk to a water fountain, and all of a sudden somebody said, mm -hmm, "You can't drink out of that one. It's for blacks only, oh colored my. only." Oh my. And it was like, you know, I get shocked in my life because, you know, you, you read about it, you hear about it, but you don't know sure. anything about it. Sure. And I said, I'm at the wrong water fountain. Somebody was nice enough to say, you know, you can't do that. So that was my first observation of segregation. And again, it's like, wow. But anyhow, you know, I get on, on the bus, we end up at Fort Knox, and I get uh, in a, into the reception center, and I get your uniforms, all this stuff. Then they come along and go through the shot line. We had to go through the shot line twice because somebody got lost. The you know, numbers don't <laughs> check. We'll do it again. But anyhow, we get done with all that stuff and they come through and say, okay, anybody who has any prior military service. And there were about out. three or four shots, I think, at the time. <laughs> and there were long needles then right. rather than the new modern. Right. Yeah, no guns. Do it twice. Yeah, we do it twice because somebody ducked out on us. I mean, that's what they. It had to be because you know they know how many people are on the list, how many who should go through the line. They were one short, so everybody goes through again. But anyway, we get done with that, and then the thing was, anybody's got any prior military fall out, so you know, half a dozen of us fall out, and uh, you know what you got. I, mean, you know, I still got my paperwork. Well, they sent me to a replacement company, and, I was and, and your paperwork meant your Navy paperwork. Right. As well as your army paperwork. Well, I just have to have my navy paperwork right there because there sure. wasn't much process. And they had all the army stuff, so I had the military and my navy stuff. And it was like, okay, so I sent me this. Till we get to, basically until we get this straightened out, you know, get straightened out, you know, we can, it'll be okay. I'm okay <laughs> with that. So I'm in a replacement company for a couple of weeks, and just doing nothing but twiddling my thumbs and, and just waiting. You know, I had no assignments to do anything. Just make your bunk up in the morning, go to child. Here's a child hall pass. That's it. So I'm in there for a couple of weeks. I remember an NCO comes up and you know, I think he was an, uh, an E5 and said, you know, Barris need to talk to you. And, uh, you know, we know, you, you know, your records say, you know, you're, you're telling us you were on the highway patrol and you got your military records from the Navy, but, you know, I can't tell you how long you're going to be here. Would you be willing to go to a, to a basic training company? You know, get the process going because when your paperwork comes and it's valid, we'll get you out of here. I said, okay. So, and he also said, we'll take care of you. And uh, which was like, okay, we'll take care of you. He said, well, it'll be okay. So I end up in a basic training company. It was B63. And you know, as I find out, we have a captain who's our CO. And uh, most of us are draftees and a few RAs regular army re hmm. recruits and uh, most in replacement companies or I'm sorry basic training companies you got your shave tail lieutenants or, or first lieutenants running the operation you know one second lieutenant's really trying to shine up on everybody else and how good they are but we got a, a captain who's a captain and everybody's like what's like you know other people around me captains don't do this well he was a flying captain and every periodic, I guess every so many years, I had to come back and do a little bit of basic to keep with grunt training and things like that. <clears throat> hmm. So anyhow, he was a super guy. And uh, I say, when I got into the company and 
what it was they I was a platoon guide so I had a responsibility for 40 people and uh, you know I had to break it down into squads and did it the easy way I had everybody's name and just divide it out by four first 10 here's the first squad second 10 is going to the second squad you know it worked out in my head and you know we had to probably like I say most of the people in, in my platoon were draftees so you know in the 21, 22, 23 year old group. And then we had a few 17 old kids that were, I mean, they could, they like playing mind games. You know, it was, yeah, so yeah, it, it worked out. But we, uh, yeah, going through that, I said the captain was just a super guy. And if he never, he never rode on anything. If we walked, he walked. We ran, he ran. And Fort Knox, you know, that two hills were called Agony and Misery Hill. And they were like climbing up mountains, but he went with us up the mountains and down the mountains. No, he never rode. And anyhow, when we got done, uh, I was an honor graduate. And what, they, what the catch was, they had a trainee in the cycle, and it was my, between myself and another kid, and uh, who he was also a draftee, and wants to go to OCS. Yeah. We want to go to OCS. And I'm thinking, okay, I'm then I'm 22. I got a good job. Yeah, I like what I was doing. Yeah, I'm in the army. I really wanted to be in the Navy, but I'm here. And it's like, no, nah, sir. I, you know, that's why it said right now. I got a good job. I like what I'm doing, and I'm not going to do it. The other kid was, yeah, I'll be glad to go to OCS. So I, he, he got the honor student, and I was the honoree. And, but again, it, everything worked out. And when I got you know done with that basic, and I think it was in November of uh, '59, yeah, '59. Then I, they said again all the way along, you know, you're gonna be okay. We'll take care of you. And I got signed to the military police company right away. Oh. So I got done with basic. I went you know, in November. I was at at the MP company. And uh, when I well, you had there, to be really admired to allow your patients to allow the Army to completely, continuously ignore the fact that you were on active duty and served in the Navy Reserve. Yeah. And that just never got resolved. Well, it, it finally did. I mean, after I hit the MP company, and uh, I'll get into that in just a little bit. When I hit the company, though, that it was kind of unusual because we, the place was full of uh, E6s and E7s, masters and you know, mm -hmm. SFCs and masters. And, uh, and what was going on, the Army was riffing a lot of people back from Korea and Second World War vets because oh, they were yeah. overpopulated, but still were doing the draft things. And it was funny because we'd have roll call, and how we worked, you worked, uh, I think how this was, worked for seven on, seven days on, off two, seven days on again, off two, seven again, and then he was off four days. Well. Those two day periods were only 48 hour blocks. At the end of it, it wasn't really a four day weekend because you got off at, at eight o'clock and you came back three days later at eight a. So it was really a quick turnaround. But anyhow, the the sergeants, they were kind of it was you know for for me and the, you know the younger guys it was funny because they would be fighting in a way verbally assaulting each other like. Okay, what's your you know data rank D O R? What's your D O R? Who's going to drive the other one? Mm -hmm. And you got S F C's and master sergeants just yeah you know, just playing with each other. But yeah, you know, now and then you have two master sergeants and two S F C's working together, and they were kind of like yeah, you know, what's your data rank? Because I'm going to drive or you're going to drive. And Trying to determine who's the senior right, yeah. and has the opportunity to command the other guy right. just by virtue of possibly a couple days difference right. in data rank. But it was just, it was, to me, it was, it was funny just watching these guys. And they were just having fun with each other, I mean, playing the mind games. Because it never, I don't think, I never saw it get serious. But they, you know, that's how the heck it was. But we, uh, you know, at the MP company, it was, it was just a lot of guys. And they were moving fast, in and out. I mean, they might be there a month or two and they'd be gone. Somebody, like another master or an SFC would come in. And it was just a turnover. And then uh, as time went on, you know, they finally got out of there. There was a lot of us that were. Uh, E2s at that time, and then finally, I'm thinking maybe in the spring of 15 to 8, 59, 
in the spring of 60, my records got, got caught up with me. And it's, you know, you're here and I'm already working and I only got a year plus to go. You know, you know why start all over again? So I, you know, my, I made, they got my payroll up and what was at that particular time, when I was in the Army, I had, had bought a new car and a new boat before I got drafted. Hmm. And when I got drafted in September, nobody's buying boats. And I could had a guy say, I'll take over your payments on your car. And my, my boat payments was $76 and a penny a month. And I was, I think when I say I had about less than $20 a month to live on. You know, you had to buy your haircuts, you had to buy your polish, shoe polish, all that other stuff. And that's all I had. So probably for a year, all I did was, and I owed him the boat for about 15 months. Sounds like you had a chance to lose a lot of weight. <laughs> I didn't do any partying. There was nothing to do. I mean, I say I had enough money to buy a couple of haircuts and, and maybe a snack, you know, hit the guidon. But it was, you know, it didn't, you know, that, it was tight. And finally, one of my records caught up with me. You know, I think we were making about 90 bucks a month. And then when my S and E one made ninety and E two you might have made at ninety five. And then when E three went like a hundred bucks. Yeah. Well when my records caught up, I ended up with let's say I had four years, six months, and nine four years, nine months and twenty three days. So I put me up four pay steps. So I think I went to hundred and forty bucks a month. Well, and plus the back pay. So that helped out tremendously. A windfall. And, yeah, a windfall. It was a windfall. <laughs> But anyhow, I, uh, you know, records finally caught up with me, and E3, and then I got, they, I got put in the uh, for E4, and Spec 4, and I made Spec 4. Well, that changed it. the money coming in from, like, say, 140 to 180 a month. And it was really an all gap. You know, you know. Executive salary. <laughs> oh, wow. But again, this, you know, it's like anything else, you gotta learn how to flow, go with a flow. And I say, I, was there and in the company, and then our company commander, the yeah, BMP commander, his name was Vincent B. Cote, and he's from, I think he's from probably where our Cote friends are from. Now, Boy, prior to starting your profession, which is a very honored profession of military police, I'd like to read a description of what the military police is from a uh, Clyde E. Rowe, Corporal Radio Operator, Fort Knox, Kentucky. This is not dated, but it's probably about 57 or 1958, wouldn't you say? Yes, sir. So allow me to read from this letter. What are these things called military police? Somewhere between the security of childhood and the insecurity of second childhood, we find there to exist a fascinating group of humanity called MPs. Girls love them, towns tolerate them, and the government supports them. An MP is the picture of laziness with a deck of cards. He's happy. He's a protector of land and always carries a copy of Playboy. He has the energy of a turtle, the slyness of a fox, the brains of an idiot, and the cunningness of a Casanova. Some of his likes are girls, women, females, broads, <laughs> dames, and members of the opposite sex, and often a few gallon of bourbon thrown in for good measure. The MP dislikes wearing his uniform, superior officers, army chow, and getting out of bed in time to go to on duty. He's the only living person known today who can cram into one small pocket a little black book, a pack of crushed L&Ms, a picture of Jane Russell, a comb, a church key, and what little he has left of last month's pay. The MP likes to spend his money on joke books, on drinks, on women, and the rest he spends foolishly. <laughs> the MP is a magic creature. You can lock him out of your home, but not out of your heart. You can scratch him off your mailing list, but not off your mind. He's a girl's lover, away from home and alone, in a cruel old world to himself, with no one to turn to in his hour of need. He's your good-for-nothing bundle of worry, a lover of nature, women, a protector of peace, his, a perfect public relations man with foreign women. 
But his best thing about him is when his ship lands stateside, he goes straight home to his wife. He makes your wildest dream come true when he looks at you with those blurry bloodshot eyes and says, Hi, honey, I'm home. Miss me? Composed and recorded this fourth day of October 1959 in and for the Central Military Police Station, Fort Knox, Kentucky. How do you feel that describes your profession, Tom? Eh, it's a little bit overboard, but I think at the end, probably like coming home with, hey, hon, I'm home. Still love you. <laughs> but, it, you know, it, it was, again, it was different. And again, I, I've learned a long time ago, you know, go with the flow. And I worked with a lot of, you know, good folks, no matter where I've been at them. Yeah, it was an experience. It was different. Uh, I think uh, the people you work with, you got to take appreciate who they are, and where they come from. And every now and then, you know, there were, we had a few goofy people, but overall, you know, we had a we had a. I can think of one guy. Uh, he was from Louisiana, uh -huh. and he was always talking about Cajun cooking and, and going down to New Orleans and doing this and doing that. But you know, if he got once you got to really know him, you know, he had a lot of BS. But he was talking some some facts too, you know, about how proud he was to become from Louisiana, and you know, just different people. It was it was great. It was great. You know, would he want to do it again? Man, not really. But again, things work out. I think you know when I was there again at the MP company, I uh, you know worked the road and. Came, you know, and once they really, you know, finally, you know, they knew what I was on a highway patrol, so they were kind of taking advantage of me in a way, which was good. I had no complaints there. But I was in, they had me working in the station, CMPS, Central Military Police Station, Fort Knox, and uh, they had a sergeant's desk there, and I worked on a desk and then worked in the dispatch. And how the, the operation was to me, from my background, was like, this place is not set up the right way like it ought to be. And one of the bosses, I don't know whether it was Captain Cote or who was it, we make it any better, you, you show me how to do it. Well, I had enough design in high school to make me dangerous. And I drew up a plan of how to remodel the CMPS hmm. station. And next thing I knew, it was like, we're going to do it. Really? So, you know, I was like, wow. You know, again, again, of course, it's an ego booster too, but again, okay, here's something I am. I was directly involved in and had an impact. And then after that, as I recall, you know, a few short months later, I uh, went to Camp Breckenridge for, the, for a summer camp, and that was TDY. And there was about a dozen of us, I reckon, or probably a platoon. Do you recall what county or city Camp Breckenridge was near? No, I don't. It could have no, been Fort Campbell, I guess. No, no, it was way, I'm trying, it was close to Indiana. Because we went uh, down the river to some place that used to get flooded out. It was right on. It was a no, notorious town, and up the street was Evansville, Indiana. Okay, so that could have been near Owensboro, I think. Okay, that sounds about right. Because that's where Danny's from, right, Vaughn? And uh, what was neat when we got down there? Sounds where who who's from? A friend of ours, Danny. Danny Outland. Okay, lives up in your neighborhood. Okay, but we uh, because of my back of being on highway patrol. They had a they had a highway patrol unit went out every night from Breckenridge, and uh, it was myself and three other guys when I was teams. And uh, one night you went out, next night you stayed on post and did your stuff. But uh, now that was strictly for uh, controlling the army or military traffic and personnel, rather right, than right. any civilian. No responsibilities, action. just army. Right. Okay. And I, I say myself, I, you know, a couple of funny things that happened was I say we're, I'm on highway patrol. I say we're going to put, you know, <clears throat> we want you once you work on the highway here, you know, just doing things. And he, Evansville's the end of the line, south. Of, I can't remember the name of the town. So we, wow. Ah, well, again, I'm 22 years old, 23, and uh, we go up whatever this town is this before you cut across the river to Evansville and it's a nice summer after evening and they got a carnival going on so the guy I'm working so he's, he's an NCO so let's see what's going on yeah any guys are in there see sure. what's going on so we pull in well it was like whoo I had never seen hoochie coochie <laughs> store or 
show. And it was like, you know, walked in and said, whoa. But again, one of the funny experiences in a way, but again, uh, not that I'm, at that time last night, I was young and dumb. And, you know, I hadn't seen a lot now, of For our audience's benefit, how would you describe Hoochie Coochie? Uh, it was a strip show. I see. And uh, I say, yeah, not, I mean, I'd never been to anything like that. Country boy in a way, but it was like, whoa. But anyhow, we went went into Evansville, and you know, just you're just looking for reservers out trying to you know, keep out of trouble. That was, nothing really you know, on our end of the plate ever happened. Was that was uh, really the document? He had a few crashes and instances where somebody on post me would get in, into the guidon, get buzzed up. You know, have to get them home, make sure they're all right. But you I'm, mentioned the word guidon. Could you describe to the audience what guidon means? It's a snack shack. It's a Navy term, but it's a snack shack. And uh, you get sandwiches and pop and candy bars and stuff like that. And uh, it's a snack shack, what it is. Kind of like a, a small neighborhood deli. Okay, thank you. But it was, again, this, it was neat. I, I, I had fun. I say, after I got done with Breckenridge, went back to the company, and then I ended up uh, in the Provost Marshal's office and uh, Again, I think on a, you know, my experience of being on the highway patrol and again taking, you know, as a boss, you learn how to take advantage of the, the training that people have or expertise that people have to make you get better. And the CO of the MP division that one got assigned to the officer, his name was, I believe, it was Fox, Major Fox. And, uh, you know, well, I got assigned to, to Fort Knox and I had to go out and document all the traffic control signs on the base of Fort Knox. Hmm. And put it and come back and then put it all on board at a huge map of Fort Knox. And uh, again, what I did, you know, working with the units that were working the shifts and say, okay, I need this crew to go out and hit these particular roads. You got stuff to do, but sometime in your shift, you know, get this done for me so I can document. And, you know, I ended up with a huge map, probably an eight by eight map of Fort Knox with all the pins on it of, like, like red pin was for a stop sign and, you know, whatever designators I had, I did, you know, they helped me get my job done. And then part of the job I was doing, Fort Knox was a very active base for dignitaries coming in and show and tell things. and. They, I got designated to make up signs, and you know it was it was almost overwhelming because it was constantly changing, which is what it was supposed to do anyhow. But you had to, I had to make these things up. One day, you know, not to I'm get my mind going, I said, "Yeah, there's got to be a better way of rather making only tag on signs. There's got to be a better way. How do we do that?" Mm. And I just thought, "I'm going to make me a traffic sign." And out of my head, I picked up a sign of, in my head was 24 by 30. And uh, I put a arrow, a movable arrow, arrow that you could move it, you know, either or, you know, any place from, from like from uh, five o'clock to seven o'clock, you couldn't go downhill, but everything above that, you can move that arrow that position. Mm -hmm. And I think it was like a three or four inch air, movable arrow with wing nuts to hold it in there. And it had three slots that put what what the event was, so and it was, you know, it worked out for me. And I think it was about the sign was, or the slots were 18 inches, so it had three inches of space on each side of it to kind of balance it out. And uh, next thing I knew, it was like, hmm, that's a pretty dang on good idea, and you know, I could knock myself out of a job. But again, it was, thank God, because it was a pain in the butt trying to get keep up with this. But again, just another to me was like. Hmm, Came up with a good idea, and you know, I sure. got a, uh, a pat on the back. I got a letter. Uh, as I, I couldn't find it, but I know I got a letter from from the CEO of taking the time and coming up with an inventive idea to save money and solve some problems. But, you, know, just you mentioned the uh, provost officer, provost marshal mm -hmm. office. Carson. Could you explain that? PMO. That was PMO officer was the provost marshal's office. And the Provost Marshal of Fort Knox was a full bird colonel. His name was uh, Kenneth A. Carson, I believe it was. And uh, he just another nice guy. But PMO, Provost Marshal, is the chief of the 
law enforcement on a on a particular base, and you know I ended up as his duty driver. So I'd pick him up in the morning and, and take him home at night. And if he wanted to go here, go there. I was you know I was his driver, and again just another nice thing. You know I had some other things, the nickel dime stuff to do, but you know when I was at his beck and call, and he wasn't you know he's a super guy. We talk a little bit, but most time he'd be in the back seat doing his paperwork and say, you know, we've got to go here and okay, I can read the map and away we go. You remember what kind of car you drove for him? Fifty seven Chevrolet, a four door sedan. Yeah. yeah. And well, in fact that's what all well, most of the fleet was at. We had a couple older ones, fifty fives I think, but fifty seven was it. But it was yeah. They're a piece of junk in a way, but it was a I guess a military purchase, you know, the least product or the least price car they could get, and that's what it was. But yeah, we worked. It you know, worked. So I say, yo, know, he was a great guy, and the rest of, again, every place in my contacts in the service, every place I was at was good. You know, just good bosses, good leaders, and you know the teammates, you know the grunts that I was part of, or just you know we got a job to do, let's do it. You know, mm -hmm. had fun. So that, that's that's basically the end of my my uh, army career. I got out in September. I got drafted on September the fifteenth, nineteen fifty nine. I was out, my ETS was September the fourteenth of sixty one, and I got it was a Thursday. And I got you know got out of the army, and Friday morning I was in back in Columbus, Ohio. I stayed. My mother lived here in town, in Cincinnati, and. Uh, Friday morning, I was in Columbus. Mm -hmm. Highway Patrol said, I want my job back. And it was like, what are you doing here? You know, we're not expecting you here. I say, I need a job. You know, I got a job. I want to come back to work. And they said, well, uh, we didn't know you was coming. Come back here Monday. And they had, I was talking to a captain who was the uh, recruitment uh, assignment officer, basically. He said, we got two spots in Ohio. Where do you want to go? And one was Ravana and the other one was Delaware. At that particular time, this was way BB before morning, that uh, you know, I was, you know, went up to her house, talked about, it, you know, I go to sign into Ravana. So I come back on Monday morning and, you know, go into the recruitment office, and there's a sergeant there, and, and uh, you know, and I, I knew who he knew him from, from the academy. And uh, he says, You're going to Cincinnati? So I'm like, What the hell are you talking about? I'm going to Cincinnati. I said, Cap told me on Friday I could go either either to Ravenna or Delaware. Mm -hmm. He says, you're going to license that. <laughs> so I was like, yeah, okay. But now, what, what was kind of neat about it is I knew, knew, the, knew, knew the sergeant anyhow from the academy, and he kind of had taken care of me in the academy one time, but uh, on, on plus. But uh, his name was Caramonte, and he ended up becoming the superintendent of Highway Patrol. And uh, going back, taking care of me, when I was in the academy, uh, academy was like uh, being in uh, in OCS. I mean, the, it was really hard. You were up to crack at dawn, did all the, the running and the jumping and the PT and all that, and then at the end of the night, at ten o'clock, lights out, up at six o'clock. You know. What was the term of that training? That was uh, sixteen weeks. Sixteen weeks is a long time. So that was my third shot of basic training too. Highway patrol for sixteen. The, the Navy for three months, and then basic at Fort Knox for two and a half months. Uh, you were a very well trained civilian, and I was ready to work. It was yeah, again, it is what it is. Nothing you do about it. You, you either comply and do what you got to do, or you, you fight the problem. You, you go to jail in the army. Or the Navy. Was there any resistance from employers to give back jobs to returning veterans in those days? I, none at all. None at all. I think you know another kind of going back on that when I. Ended up in the Army down at Fort Knox in the reception center. One of my classmates out of Patrol Academy is in another group of, re of new people coming in. It's like, what are you doing here? It's the same thing you are. I got drafted too. And then when I got out of the Army, again in, in August or September of 61, is when the Berlin Wall had gone up. And they were going to extend everybody in 61. And that was less than a month later. Yes, but it, well, no, it was before that because they were getting ready to do it. August 61. Right. 
Because when I got it, out, they said that... It had already been done. Right. And then you were right on the edge for being staying in or being recalled. Right, being extended. Extended. And I... The without extended, getting out. Right. And the extended day was October the 1st, so I missed it by, what, 16 days? But anyway, when I get back into Columbus on that Monday morning, I'm you know, getting my new my old equipment from the patrol one of my another one of my classmates he's turned his stuff in and you know what's going on here and you know you're small talk and you know what are you quitting for he's i quit he's i just got a recall <laughs> so i'm getting out he's going back in that was a pretty close call oh whew. yeah mine was really close but again it was you, know, you got to do what you got to do but like I said, I felt for him, you know, here he is, he did his two years. He got out in February, got recalled for another year in October or in September. And it was this, again, one of those things. He ended up as a pilot for the Highway Patrol. Mm. So, again, this Larry Myers was his name. But again, this, you got to learn how to go with the flow. Go with the flow if you want to survive. Now, could you briefly outline your career in the uh, Highway Patrol? I, I started in the Academy of... October of 57, and we graduated January 24th of 60, or no, 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 58, January 58, and my first assignment was Cambridge, which is on the eastern part of Ohio, mm -hmm. and uh, I was there for a short time from January through, uh, I think, August or September, and fellow at Bridgeport, which is across the river from Wheeling, he wanted to come back to Cambridge. And uh, we've got a family, and you know, I'm single, so hey, you know, you're gonna like Bridgeport. And in academy, you know, they were always talking about, you know, spots, you know, you don't, you know, in any service where you don't want to go because of. And of course, that was already in my head, and I'm like, oh God, that's why he wants to come back and he wants to send me down there. Well, anyhow, you're going. I got down to Bridgeport, and it was like, like working in Warren County, just good people, and had good. a lot of fun. And that's where I got drafted in '61 or in '59. So we, you know, there. And then after I got out of the army, I see, I'm going. I thought I was going to go to Ravenna, and said, "No, you know, like Cincinnati." And I came down here in September of '61. Assigned to Mount Carmel post on the east side of town until '61, and then that opportunity to. Starting a new program with the Highway Patrol was it's called Subpost, and it had it way back when, probably seven or eight years before this opportunity came up. They're going to start it again, where they have troopers assigned to a county, and they would live in that county and work out of another post. And I say I'm single, and you know, take advantage of opportunities, and uh, so I put in for it. And the post commander I was working for, his name was Luke Cornwade. Lou said, you sure you really want to go up there? And it was like, it was fun. And he get another opportunity. So I got made, you know, put in my paperwork, and then I got assigned to Warren County and came up here on April 1st of 64. And I said, it was two of us. We started the program here in the state again. And the word out of Columbus was, when we had pep talk, it was like, you know, you make this thing happen because if it don't happen, where it's going to be you guys that didn't make it. I say with himself, another classmate, and then you know, we got it going and got a third guy who came in, his name was Marvin Holbrook, and uh, this, my, my classmate, he was a, a former uh, captain in the Army, and he got promoted uh, probably within the first year, 65, he got promoted, and then I got promoted in 66, and got transferred to Xenia, and then from Xenia, I was up there, what, eight or nine months? And then came back to Lebanon because they were building a new post. So we came back to Lebanon. We were still assigned to Hamilton Post then. And then we hmm. opened the post up that late that summer, as I recall. And then uh, met, had met Bonnie in the, in the process. And, yeah, you know, things worked out that way too, very well. And uh, I say we had an opportunity to go to Columbus. They wanted to you know, offer me an opportunity to, to go to. General headquarters, and uh, <coughs> yeah, it's kind of like you know, things are going great down here. I like Warren, down in Warren County, and uh, yeah, good people. You know, had fun. Bonnie was working. We had two kids, and kids were in school. And yeah, you know, what's the advantage? Yeah, you know, you're happy where you're at, 
it as well. It wasn't like it was pig in a poke, but it's like, you know, we feel good here. So we stayed and then uh, end up retiring in January of 88. I had 30 years on the highway patrol and uh, had the opportunity to run for sheriff. Wonderful. And uh, ran for sheriff and uh, in, a pro in between the highway patrol, I, I worked for Springboro Police Department, keep my ticket active. And I, I won a sheriff in 1992. I was a sheriff for 16 and a half years. Retired in 88, and you were elected sheriff in 1992. And four years in there, you were in Springboro. Yes, sir. Okay. And then you were sheriff of Warren County, Ohio, for how long? Uh, 16 years and seven months. I got appointed to, to I, what happened to sheriff uh, who was in office then, he retired in a campaign just prior to the election. So I got appointed to fill the vacancy that he created. So that's where that seven months came in. So, you know, I Great. tried for four years. So we, that's where the 16, seven came in. And then that brings us up to, are you still sheriff? No, I'm not. I retired two years ago in 2009, January 2009. And then I ran for county commissioner and that started in January the 1st of 2011. Well, that was a pretty important career step. Yeah, I can't, you know, Warren County is such a unique place and oh. where we're at and what opportunities are here for, for people. Again, you were, you were situated between two metro areas and, uh, you know, the impact, Warren County is the second fastest growing county in Ohio. 1990, our population was, I believe, 113,000. And now we're 215 plus. You know, just that short period of time, how much growth has happened here. Uh, yeah, it's just a great area to, to live in. And you know, I say the opportunity we had to go to Columbus, like, yeah, we're much better off here. And what I can read from the uh, news media, Warren County's always been, uh, particularly recently, recognized as being a very uh, well run, well managed, and well financed county. Is that true? Yes, sir very conservative and uh, financially wise is, you know, doing what has to be done right. Don't waste your money. Uh, you don't have it because, you know, taxpayers got to pay your way. And, you know, efficient use of taxpayer money. And that's where we are right now. And, I, you know, as a good point for Warren County, we're probably in a top five rated county out of the 88. And I think we're the only county that, that does not have a deficit we've not had you know, right now it's been some tough times but the county's not had any layoffs it is economic pressure times right now mm -hmm. uh, and we've had a lot of growth so I've been able to keep up with it. the other office holders whether it be at the local level when I talk about townships and cities and villages uh, working hard and at the county level that uh, the county elected officials are very efficient in conserving dollars and you know, not wasting money, holding tight, and still providing good quality service. And that's particularly admirable in these times of a uh, relatively depressed economy, don't you think? Oh, most definitely. Okay. Most definitely. Prior to concluding our interview with you, Tom, today, um, I'd like to ask you a question about World War II, which we generally ask. And the question is a simple one. What, what do you feel about, or what are your feelings towards the uh, decision by the president to drop the atom bomb on uh, Japan twice? Yeah, my, my personal feeling is I think, you know, you hate to see a lot of people die, but that's what war is about. And by dropping the bomb, the first bomb attracted the attention of Japanese, and they, thought, yeah, they must have thought we were just playing one. Took the second bomb to do it, and there was a lot of people who died in Nagasaki, and, and to, what was the other time? Uh, Nagasaki. And Hiroshima. Hiroshima. Yeah, a lot of people died. But if Japan had not surrendered, how many American and lives of our allies would have died in that invasion? Mm -hmm. And most of them would have been Americans. And most of them, those Americans died would have been Marines. And you know, having to take take the the landing assault. And how many civilians besides military people would have died? 
So again, to me, I think it was you know it was a tough decision. The president made it you know to me it made a good decision, the right decision for us and for Japan. It's, it's a tough decision. I'm glad he had to make it, not me. I agree. Uh, probably one of the most difficult decisions any president has ever been faced with. Most definitely. From talking to other veterans and reading the current history on the subject, uh, I understand that we had thousands of ships ready to make the transition or the transit across the Pacific with troops armed and ready to invade. And uh, some people even said that it could have been the absolute end of the United States Marine Corps. It would have been so devastating. So everybody historically looking from hindsight agrees with that opinion. Yeah. Unless you have anything to add, Tom, I'd like to uh, say uh, thank you very, very much for your service to the United States of America. And uh, we appreciate you coming down here today for this interview. And uh, we'll look forward to uh, seeing you on DVD sometime. Thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, just, me and I, myself, I, just, you know, I had a minor run, nothing. Vets, Second World War, Korea, Nam, and now Afghanistan and Iraq, those are heroes. And they, yeah, just how much we as citizens owe it to the vets that are out there doing that are in combat. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate it. Been fun. And we'd like to thank our cameraman, Brian yes, sir, Powers. Brian, thank you.